We good? All right, we are good. Hi, everybody. Welcome on Twitch and here at Momocon. Thank you very much for coming out to the Inti Creates panel. And uh, I want to start things off with a little bit of an apology because uh, normally we would have myself and another guy from Inti Creates up here. But uh, my boy, our CEO, Takuya Aizu, is stuck in Japan and was not able to make it to Momocon because of a last minute emergency. So we got a little bit of a different thing going on. So as you may have saw from the program, this panel is going to be about developing 2D action games and like US and Japanese indies. Well, that US and Japanese indies part was all in Aizu-san's head. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about something that I know much more about that I can share with you guys which is Japanese to English localization. So I hope that's cool with y'all. Is that cool with y'all? Is that good? We cool? We cool? Excellent, excellent. So I'm gonna kick things off, just gonna jump right in. My name is Matt Papa. I am the producer localization director, or the Kai Guy Guy, as I call myself. Kai Guy, of course, means Japanese for overseas. Uh, if you're wondering what a producer does, so for example, I am the producer on the Galgun series. Anyone y'all anyone y'all know Galgun? Please say, oh, you beautiful, beautiful people. So I'm the kind of person who decides that, hey, you know, we should bring this game to the West, or hey, we should include a pair of underwear and call it a screen cleaner in the collector's edition. That's my job. You know, localization director, I'm basically in charge of all of our English to, or Japanese to English localization. So we're a Japanese company. All of our games get made in Japanese first, and it's my job to make sure that all you fine folks can read them and understand what the hell's going on. And then I do everything from do these events, run our Twitch channel, manage our Twitter, all kinds of other stuff. Now, at a place like this, I always feel like you can really get to know somebody by knowing what their favorite games in anime are. Of course, my favorite games, Mega Man 2, Final Fantasy Tactics, and Super Mario RPG. It has been that way since I've been about 13 years old and hasn't changed and probably never will. Favorite anime, Azumanga Daio, Trigun, and is the Order a Rabbit. I'm getting some, I'm getting some finger guns, I appreciate that. And of course, when you do what I do, you get the interest. You get to see a lot of really interesting Japanese words. My favorite one is nandeanen. Anyone, of any of y'all have ever heard the Japanese word before? Nandeanen. I get a couple finger guns. Okay, nandeanen is like it's Osaka dialect for like. It basically means like what the hell. It's a great word. I love it. And of course, I have our CEO Takuya Aizu. He's a swell guy, but he's stuck in Japan. <laughs> He's very much stuck in Japan, and so we're not going to get to learn what his favorite games or his favorite anime or his favorite Japanese words are, but of course, because he is there. Now, you might be wondering, who the hell are these Inti Creates guys? We've been making games for the past 23 years, since 1996. We are an independent developer based out of Chiba, Japan. Uh, the first game that we ever released that y'all will probably be familiar with is Mega Man Zero, back on the Game Boy Advance. <laughs> And so we started off with the Mega Man Zero series, following up into Mega Man ZX, of course Mega Man 9, Mega Man 10, some of the classic Mega Mans. And as we got later into our years, we started developing our own original IPs and started publishing those. That began, of course, with our title Azure Striker Gunvolt, and then leading into other stuff like Gal Gun, which is another one of our originals, Dragon Mark for Death, and uh, recently we continue to work with other IPs, such as Bloodstain, with our release of Bloodstain. Curse of the Moon. So if you're familiar with any of these games, you guys can probably tell we really like making like action style games and Galgun. <laughs> so what I'm here to talk to y'all about today is something that I've been doing ever since I started at Indie Creates five years ago, which is Japanese to English localization. And that really is kind of like the core focus of what any Japanese company needs in order to produce content in, for the Western market. Because a good localization or a bad one can kind of determine the fate of a project in anywhere outside of Japan. A good localization can really make a game shine, and a bad localization can take what's an otherwise amazing game and can make it a sour experience for people. I try to do a lot more of the former and not too much of the latter. Now, when I started off with Japanese to English localization, uh, the first game I ever did was Azure Striker Gunvolt 1 uh, for Steam. And when I first did it, and I think a lot of localization people will say the same thing. When I really say, I didn't really know what the hell I was doing. And what I mean by that is you have an entire story and you have to take that story that's in Japanese and comp press it in a way that is completely understandable to anybody else who speaks any other foreign language. And when you work with a lot of games, that can be really tricky to do. 
because you have to determine, you know, how, what are you going to call all these like made up stuff. So when you have a, you know, a project like that, there are all kinds of different, you know, names of characters, you know, names of organizations, names of special moves, special attacks, all kinds of things like that. It is really up to you to decide how you're going to do that. And when it comes to localization, there's honestly a lot of different schools of thought. Uh, there are, is the camp of people who are very intent on keeping the content exactly how it is in the, its original Japanese. You don't change a thing, you keep it exactly the way it is. If it's done like this in Japanese, it should be exactly like that in English, come hell or high water. And then there's people who, and you saw this a lot maybe in the early days of localization, maybe in like the 16-bit era and the 32-bit era, which is taking the original source material and kind of maybe sort of paying attention to it. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we still even had some amazing games that came out of that school of localization thought. And, you know, in those days, we were really none the wiser when, you know, thing A was happening in the original Japanese and thing B was something light years beyond what was happening for the English version. And honestly, sometimes vice versa. So for me, I try to do the best I can to kind of bridge the gap because there's a lot of things in Japanese that really just do not translate over to English or any other language for that matter. And Japanese has a lot of these. So as a localization person, one of the biggest challenges and honestly one of the most fun parts about doing this job is how are you going to bridge this weird Japanese gap to, in, into something that people of all cultures and languages can appreciate. Let me give you an example. In Galgun 2, when you're having a conversation with Risu the angel, she mentions that, oh, when she was in her school days, in her school cafeteria, she really loved udon. That's her favorite food. You guys know what udon noodles are, right? I can assume you all know what that is. Okay. So she's like, I can never decide if I like kanto udon or kansai udon the best. But at the end of the day, it's all about that kanto udon. Now, who knows what in the world I'm talking about when I say kanto udon or kansai udon? Location, yes, but what is, but what is that? What is Kanto Udon versus Kansai Udon besides the location? Hon and honestly, I don't even think a lot of Japanese people even know the difference. So you gotta take these things, it's like, okay, I have, these two types, I have these two types of the same food. No one in the US is gonna know what the hell this means. How can I translate this into something that people can appreciate? So when I ask you guys, what's the first thing, what's the first type of food you think of that has two very, distinct but similar varieties that people get really intense in their feelings about. Exactly, pizza. <laughs> Thick crust pizza versus thin crust pizza. Everyone's got their camp, everyone's got their opinions, and so when I decided to do this, I'm like, yes, pizza, that's it. That's how I'm gonna do this. And you can translate the idea without necessarily using the word for word Japanese that you see. And that is one of, honestly, the most fun things to do. And because for me personally, it's not so much about you must keep these exact Japanese words exactly the way they are. It's conveying the feeling. It's conveying the idea. You know, it's making a cheeky 90s anime reference or it's talking about two different types of food or whatever it may be. It's getting the idea across in a way that people who speak whatever language you're translating it in can appreciate and get that same sort of reaction that you're hoping for. That's what fuels us in what we do with localization. And so Galgun, ironically enough, Galgun has, despite what you may know about it being silly and sexy and all that stuff, has provided some of the most fun localization challenges in my entire career at Nancy Crates. And I'll give you another example. So how many of y'all have played Galgun? out here, a show of hands, how many of y'all played Galgun? Okay, so there's a character in Galgun whose name is Corona. She's this mischievous, mischievous like demon girl who is always trying to cause trouble for the main protagonist. And in Japanese, whenever she talks, every single time she says the Japanese word desu. You guys know the Japanese word desu? It means like the verb to be or like is, right? Every time she says the word desu in Japanese, which is about, 80 to 90 percent of the sentences she speaks, instead of saying desu, you know, the two Japanese characters, it says death in all English capital letters. You know, it's like a play on words because the Japanese word desu is a homonym for the English word death. It sounds exactly the same. Desu, desu. Exactly the same. So that's like a cheeky little wordplay that was like a fundamental part of her character, though. 
So you got to ask yourself, okay, this chick is saying death in like 90% of her sentences. That's not really going to make a whole lot of sense if I just leave it as is, right? You can only play with the word death so much. It only has so many meanings. So, you, so it's like, okay, she's got this kind of wordplay, cheeky, fun thing going on. How can I turn this into English? And I rack my brain, I rack my brain, like, okay, she's a demon. What some, you know, you, you play a lot of word association when you do this kind of thing. It's like, wait, she's a demon. What are some of the first things you think of when you think of demons? Anybody? What was that? Fire, sure. Any others? Where do demons live? Exactly. Well, I was like, okay, well, hell's a versatile word, isn't it? What the hell? That's crazy as hell. That's hella interesting. What the hell is going on here? You can really play around with the word hell. So every word, or not every word, every sentence that Corona speaks in her entire dialogue across two games, every time she says the word to be, we had to find a way to weave the word hell into her sentence. Big, bold, capital letters, hell. But, and that's part of the fun challenge of localization, because you, you, know, you could take the easy route and just say, eh, well, that's too much work. I'm not going to really give her that quirk. I could just, it'd be way simpler to just write, use the word is or the word to be, and just not even bother with that, and just let the Japanese fans enjoy it. But that wouldn't be fair to you guys, now would it? Definitely not. So that's kind of like a microcosm of what can go into the word of world of localization. But the other thing you could run into is that when you're a busy studio like us, there's a lot of ways you can translate certain Japanese words. And I'll give you another example that literally had me up until 3 in the morning the night before we, we sent Gal Gun Double Piece off to Sony for approval. Literally, like hours before. You know, I can only test games so much. And when you work at like an all Japanese environment, if you're the only person who speaks English, you're the only person who can check this kind of stuff. And in a lot of cases where you work at a Japanese environment like that, that's honestly how the situation is. So, you know, you do your best and you hope to God there's no typos or weird things or things you think are funny, but like nobody else thinks are funny. You really hope there's none of those that make it through. And, you know, there's a lot of Japanese words that could have multiple meanings. So when we were about to send out Galgun Double Piece, in parts of the game, you can kind of move your cursor around. So you got, like, the character, and you can move the cursor around. It's like, you know, it's like head or right arm or left leg or whatever. As you move the cursor around, those little things pop up. It shows you where it is. Well, one of the words that you, that's part of the whole data bank for that is the Japanese word koshi. Now, koshi can have two different meanings. It could mean your lower back, you know, like right down here, it could mean your lower back, but it could also mean your hips. Like very different parts of your body, but it's the exact same word in Japanese. And unless you have that visual context, you will have honestly no idea what it's gonna be. You just gotta hope and pray. Well, <laughs> literally the night before, we were gonna send this game through, I'm checking it, it's my last finalist, finalist, finalist check, and I get to the ending part where you have to move the cursor around to all the different parts of the character's body. And I move it right where her hips are. And it says lower back. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> that is not what you want to see when you're about to ship a game off for printing. Because you imagine, you're, you worked so hard, you played for hours, you get to this kind of racy ending scene, and you move the cursor up to your favorite character's hips just for it to say lower back. How awkward and weird would that be? Not a good look. So I basically had to stop the entire operation and say, guys, I know you just made the final ROM, but we gotta fix this. And I got a lot of pushback. I was like, well, you know, as a producer, sometimes you just gotta let things go. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Would you let that go? Absolutely not. So there could be some really, really, really big near misses when it comes to that stuff because with just the nature of the way Japanese is, visual context is extremely, extremely important. And if you do not have that visual context, you could really screw it up big time. So if you ever get into, if you ever see something that just looks like it doesn't make any sense or like, especially in like older Japanese games, that's probably what happened in all honesty. 
but some of the near misses make the best stories. And maybe one day at a panel down the road, I can tell y'all about probably the craziest one that actually just happened about a week ago. So hopefully you can come see us at another panel. Maybe I'll tell you guys that story. Because I can't tell you right now because it has a lot of spoilers in it. But maybe another time. Because I was sweating bullets. <laughs> Absolutely. You do not want to be sweating bullets at a time like that. But and I know, honestly, I can go on and on about English to Japanese localization. And I'll be doing a Q&A at the end of the panel if you have any specific questions you would like to ask. But I want to kick things over to the development side of the panel. But before I do that, I have a little tasty morsel I would like to share with you guys. So if you don't mind, I'm going to put your peepers over to the screen and let's hope this video works. All right, so I am very proud to announce right here at Momocon for the very first time that we are releasing our Switch debut title, Blaster Master Zero, on Steam. And it is going, I am literally going to put this thing up live right after this panel. And we're going to be releasing it June 14th, 2019, right on Steam. And as Integrates, as a company, we are going to be making a concentrated effort to put a lot more of our past titles on Steam going forward. And we're gonna be starting things off with Blaster Master Zero 2. So if you guys are PC gamers or you like playing your stuff on PC, starting at five o'clock, so in about 40 minutes, the page is gonna be live on Steam and we're gonna be putting it out for final release on June 14th. So I'm very, very happy to be able to share with that with you guys today. And that is gonna be a perfect segue for me into talking about how we develop games with using Blaster Master Zero as an example because Blaster Master Zero was probably one of the most fun titles I've ever worked on in my five years at Indie Creates mainly because and I sw I got a good story for you guys so Blaster Master Zero would literally not exist if I did not hurt myself at E3 2015 let me tell you how that happened so E3 2015 was my very first E3 ever you know, growing up as a kid, loving video games, you know, E3, that was like the promised land, right? You know, you'd see it in like GamePro and EGM and all the stuff from E3, and like it's like a dream wonderland as a young child growing up. I finally got to go to E3 in 2015, and I was so excited. I had an amazing first day. I met so many cool developers, got to try out so many new things, got to hang out in Nintendo's booth for like an hour. It was amazing. And, you know, the, the hall closed for the day. We're at, like, a hotel at night, you know, just hanging out with developers and just chatting. And we're in this hotel lobby, and I sit down, and I'm like, oh, my back hurts a little bit. But I didn't really think anything of it. And I'm walking back to our hotel later on that night. It's like, wow, my back actually kind of hurts. But, like, I was like, oh, I might have just, like, strained it or something. No big deal. It wasn't enough to even, like, really make me think twice about it. I go into bed, go to sleep, 
Wake up the next day for day two of E3, and it feels like someone jammed a knife into my lower back. I'm like, koshi. <laughs> and I, I couldn't move. I was like paralyzed with pain. It was the worst pain still to this day that I've ever felt in my life. And well, I later learned that I severely pinched my sciatica nerve in my lower back, and I couldn't move. Literally, I was helpless. And I had to call Aizu-san, who would normally be sitting right here. You know, could you imagine calling your boss, the CEO of a company, saying, hey man, I can't move. Can you come to my hotel room and help me get up so I can go to the bathroom? <laughs> now just imagine calling your boss and making that phone call for a minute. Just a hot second, you can see the predicament I was in. Um, but to his credit, he did it, <laughs> and he's a really good guy. So if you ever see him, make sure you tell him how nice of a guy he is, because he truly is a wonderful human being. So when I'm at conventions and stuff with him, you know, he's, he's a Japanese speaker, he doesn't speak too much English. So when we do panels and stuff, or we do interviews or things like that, I'm always interpreting for him. So, but since I am literally bedridden and not able to move, calling my wonderful mother over there, who is a nurse, freaking out, asking her what I should do, uh, he all of a sudden was very free for the day. So he was walking around E3 and he bumps into a friend of his from Sunsoft. Of course, the IP owners and original creators of Blaster Master. And his buddy from Sunsoft was trying to get into a meeting with Nintendo. And he was having a lot of trouble and just was not able to make it happen. So Aizu-san found a, another friend of ours who helped them kind of get together with Nintendo and he managed to help set up this meeting. And they were pitching, Sunsoft was pitching to Nintendo at the time that they wanted to reboot one of their former IPs, mainly Blaster Master because, you know, the original Blaster Master for NES, as if you guys are gamers, you probably know, was a pretty, pretty popular title back in the day. And, you know, wasn't going maybe as good as they were hoping, you know, kind of iffy on maybe the possibilities. So, you know, Aizu-san, our CEO, chimes in, he's like, hey, what if we had Indie Creates developed it instead? And they were just like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Oh, yeah, let's do it. Oh, that sounds great. And that was that. Blaster Master Zero was born at E3 2015 because I was messed up my back so bad <laughs> that I literally was stuck in bed and could not move. So if Blaster Master, or if I didn't hurt my back severely at E3, I would not be sitting here today talking to you about Blaster Master Zero because it probably wouldn't even exist. So, but and as far as how we develop games, you know, we at Indie Creates, we're about a company of, I'd say around this day and age, around 90 to 95 people. And with a company in that size, you're always working on multiple titles at the same time. So generally at Indie Creates, we're working on anywhere from about three to five different titles at the same time. And the way we do things here at Indie Creates is we'll have, you know, we have a, t we, have a team or have it set up as teams. So we'll have like a team of, you know, uh, people who do sprites and people who do 3D graphics and people who are uh, producers and the directors and the programmers. And they all kind of will shift and move around to different projects as needs kind of ebb and flow. And with a game like Blaster Master, we are working with another company's IP. So when you, and which, we as Indie Creates working with stuff like Mega Man and Bloodstain and things like that, it's something we do, we've done a lot in the past. So when you're working with another company's IP, it kind of changes the whole dynamic of everything you do to develop a game. Because you know, if it's your own IP, you, know, you can do whatever the hell you want with it. But when you work with another company's IP, you constantly need to check in with the original IP holders and make sure everything's cool and make sure everything's the way that they want to because they want to make sure that they're intellectual properties being used properly. So that kind of adds a whole nother different uh, aspect on things. But when it comes to us, you know, generally any, our dev cycles can run anywhere from four to six months to something like Dragon Mark for Death, which was on and off over a period of over eight years. So when it comes to game dev, you know, we've cranked out titles. I think we did a, uh, read an AMA a couple months ago, and I was actually revealed to me for the first time that we developed Mega Man Zero 2 or 3, literally within start to finish in four months. Which if you know anything about game development, you know that that is like a breakneck, absolutely insane pace for a game like that. But 
really what it comes down to at the end of the day is that, and one of the first things that surprised me a little bit, but honestly made me feel right at home, was that, you know, even with a, you know, pretty decent sized, you know, Japanese game company, you know, when I first got in there, you know, as like the only, like the only real like foreign employee, you come to, I came to realize, and this is something I still love about Inti Creates to this day, that we're all just a bunch of nerds. <laughs> Every last one of us. We're, my, my uh, fellow coworkers could be sitting out here at Momocon and they would fit right in. Because like, that's, because you know, when you, when you make games like us, you know, we are, we're a very niche company. We make a whole bunch of 2D action games, we make a whole lot of sprite games, and Galgo. <laughs> so, you know, we kind of attract s certain types of people. And we're, we're all a bunch of nerdy people. We love our anime, we love our games. I cannot think of a single person who has, who does not have some sort of figures or statues or something of their favorite characters or games on their desk, yours truly included. I honestly have too many. Um, but that's one of the things I truly, truly, truly love about us because I have not met more people knowledgeable about retro games and you know, anime, weird anime from like the 70s as like some of my fellow coworkers. And I think that's, because we have so much passion for these things, because at the end of the day, us developers, we're fans too. We're fans of all this stuff too. And it's because we're fans of this stuff that we love to create it. And we consume just as many games and anime as y'all do, frankly, if not more, because <laughs> that's just how it works. And you know, when it and, and you can take all that and turn it into something really cool because one of the things that we do when we decide if we're gonna do a uh, new intellectual property like at Indie Creates, one of the things we do is we'll hold like internal design contests. And this is honestly how some of our biggest IPs like Azure Striker Gunvolt and like Galgun came to exist in the first place. We'll get all, literally anybody at the company, if you're a localization person or a programmer or an artist, doesn't matter, make a pitch, anything. If you think this game will be cool, make a pitch and send it in. And then we have internal contests to see what could be the most interesting game. So when a guy with the name of Masatori, Masanori Ito said, hey, what if we took a light gun shooter, but instead of zombies, we made it cute girls? That's how Galgun was born. That's it, literally. Something as simple as that turned, you know, you start from there and it buds into something beautiful and wonderful. And, you know, that's kind of like a microcosm of how things work at Inti Creates. And, you know, over the years, because we've done so many things like 2D action games, a lot of the games you see that we've done, Azure Striker Gunvolt, Dragon Mark for Death, even Blaster Master Zero, it's all done using our own original in-house engine. That's something that we as Inti have built over the years and fine-tuned over the years. You know, you gotta make it work with new systems as they come out and all that kind of stuff. So that really is at the core of Inti Creates' DNA. So, you know, that kind of, I think kind of speaks a lot of what we do as a company. But, you know, I think, oh, my computer, oh, there it goes. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much sums up what I think I can explain to you about how uh, we develop games. Because like I said, I'm more on the localization side. So I think what would be good for me is if any of y'all have any questions, uh, that would be a good time to ask them. I'm gonna dedicate pretty much the rest of the panel here to taking you guys as questions and so if you guys have any questions, come to where this fine gentleman in the purple shirt is. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and line up behind him, and I will certainly do my best to answer them. You can get us. Yeah, you can go ahead. I'm sorry, I really need a swig of water. Oh, is his mic on? Oh, can we get some uh, help with his mic? Uh, okay. There it is. Oh, yeah. Hello, sir. Um, as someone who is who wants to possibly work as a game developer in Japan, sure, sure, sure. Right now, I have taken the JLP team, so I've taken the N5. Okay, congrats. Did you pass? Yeah, I, I Good. passed. Congratulations. Um, Congratulations. I want to maybe take it up to N3 or N4 sure, at sure, some sure. point, but as someone who has development skills, 
at what level do you think it would be viable to at least work in an environment like that? <laughs> there we go. So if you want to work in an all Japanese environment, like say like Inti Creates is, like I am one of only three non-native Japanese speakers there. And I would say if you're talking about a JLPT level, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the JLPT is the Japanese language proficiency test. And it is like a basically globally recognized uh, proficiency test in Japanese. Um, five being the lowest level, top level one being pretty much native speaker level. Um, I would say if you have a two or a one, companies love ones, don't get me wrong. Um, but a lot of times I think you can get by with an N2. Um, I personally never took the JLPT, um, but I think when a lot of the companies who are looking for people with specific JLPT requirements, general, I've never seen anything but a two or one in my entire experience. Never? Never. Okay. I've never seen like, oh, three is cool or four. I've never seen anything below a two in in terms of like job requirements or like j in like job postings and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you are working to not just be able to work at a Japanese company, but honestly live your life comfortably in Japan and be able to communicate with not just your coworkers but your neighbors and shopkeepers and everyone else in your daily life, uh, N three will get you there, uh, and two will make you start to really feel okay. like you're all integrated with that. You always shoot for the stars and go for I N1. Know. I don't even know if I'm there, to be honest with you. Because um, at least from what I was told, some uh, I was attempting to uh, find a job there. Apparently, there is a bit of a shortage for developers over there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they'd be willing to work. Uh, they possibly would be willing to work out with some of the requirements. Um, at least that's from what my friend told me because he worked as an IT recruiter. Yeah, I think in the world of IT is a little bit different. I think a lot of IT professionals in Japan uh, have a lot more leeway when it comes to language ability. Uh -huh. um, but I think for the game industry, because, you know, I think if, if especially if you're going to work at like a smaller, more or like medium sized company like us, um, no one at my company is speaks any English enough to even have like a basic conversation. And so all business internal and external is conducted in Japanese. Okay. So you need to be able to follow along with that and you need to be able to communicate everything you would do with your job in Japanese at all times. Okay. So that's honestly, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, if the, you know, for hiring or if we can do any sort of thing. And the first question I ask is, can you speak Japanese enough to communicate pretty much fluently? And do you have a four year bachelor's degree? If you do not have either of those things, you're it's going to be really, really, yeah. really tough. Because I'm, I'm, I'm close to graduation soon. So okay. Well, I'm congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah, just, that was just something that I really wanted to see if I can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely, if you getting the bachelor's degree is definitely a great step one. And then, you know, by any means necessary, increasing that Japanese proficiency, you know, being it, you know, surrounding yourself with Japanese content, maybe finding some way to do like a, some sort of prolonged stay in Japan. Uh, this can go a really long way okay. in helping with your community. Great All question. Right. Thanks All a lot, right. man. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Hey. Hello. So uh, a topic that's been kind of hot in the, in the gaming world sure. recently mm -hmm. is workplace culture in, okay. in yeah. development studios. And you, you hear some of these horror stories that come out of places about crunch and these outrageous hours that people are working <laughs> I don't know if you saw the Kotaku piece they did on Bioware a little while back. I don't think I saw that one, no. Um, but y you hear this, and it's really discouraging for people who want to get into yeah. the business, and they see this like, I don't want to get involved in where I'm going to have to work hundreds of hours a week, and it's some crazy business. Uh, so from your experience, is that just the way it has to be with development? And at NT Creates, so uh, now, what's your been your experience there? How do they manage the workplace culture? Now, I think with Indie Creates, and, and I know Isaacson, if he was here, he'd be the first to say, is that he does not want people working long hours. Um, with the nature of game development and how volatile it can be, mm -hmm. and you know how discovering a last minute game breaking bug the night before you're about to ship can be the difference in your game failing miserably or it succeeding. So there are always going to be times, and especially in a, something like game development, where emergency, all crap, this is on fire, all hands on deck, needs to happen sometimes, unfortunately. And that's just the nature of game development, whether you're a team of two or a team of 2,000. 
Um, but generally, you know, you do hear a lot of horror stories about workplace crunch, and I really wish it wasn't that way. Um, I think it's become such a norm in the industry that it's kind of been just kind of low-key accepted by a lot of people over the years. And, you know, in, you know, in Japanese work culture is notoriously, uh, is notorious for being, you know, people spending long hours at the office and uh, working, them, literally working themselves to death. Jap Japan had literally had to invent a word for death by overwork. Um, so, you know, it's definitely something that, you know, us over in Japan are very familiar with as well. Um, do I think it needs to be that way? Uh, no, I don't. I definitely think one of the biggest things affecting it is, like I said, you know, with it, for Japan, working those crazy long hours is so ingrained in the culture that even when, you know, the Japanese government tries to do things like, you know, the last Friday of every month, everybody leaves at three, nobody does it. Even if they have the opportunity to. A lot of people that I know, not just in my own company, but anywhere, they stay because they want to. And, you know, and, you know so a lot, sometimes it is up to the individual. Um, you know, but you know, when you see like the prolonged crunches of 80, 100 hours a week for weeks on end, it really, it really bums me out. And I really wish that wasn't the case. And I feel like you know, it, it would take a lot to undo that kind of DNA that's been created over the years. Do I hope it's possible? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I do everything I can to avoid that. Um, I don't believe in that. I think it's, you should not work yourself to death for anybody, <laughs> um, you know, I work at my best and I think everyone works at their best when they're rested and can think clearly. Once you get to a certain point, your brain is just goop. <laughs> you, you can't think clearly anymore. Um, but do I, I certainly hope that things do change over the years because I can only imagine as somebody out from the outside looking in how uh, disenfranchising that can be for sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, great question. Uh, with the release of Blaster Master Zero Two, it mm -hmm. was a surprise release yes. <laughs> to a Nintendo Direct. What is it like preparing for something like that, where the public has no idea it exists, <laughs> and then an hour later, yeah, man, tons it, of people playing it. It's it's honestly it's it's fun, but it's also really tough at the same time. You know, you know, working with this kind of material, you're oh, you always have ten thousand secrets in the back of your head about stuff before everybody else does. Uh, but, you know, getting to work with Nintendo of America on something like a Direct was really fun um, because, you know, it, you know, as, you know, as a Nintendo fan, it's really exciting to be like, ooh, I'm in the in crowd. I get to, you know, contribute to something like a Direct. It's really fun. Um, but so with the way that works is, you know, obviously all these things are prepped way in advance. So you need to make sure that, you know, you have your, have your announcement materials planned out, your trailers made, you know, your copy written all well in advance. And really just, you know, not being a blabbermouth at that point <laughs> is really what it comes down to. And, you know, making sure that, you know, I think some people when they have a surprise announcement like that or a shadow drop, as we call it, um, some people will send out, you know, like press releases and stuff like that in advance, you know, to like media outlets to let them know, hey, this thing's coming so they can be ready. When it hits, you know, that direct drops, boom, psh, it's all ready to go. But then you also run the risk of if somebody maliciously or unintentionally leaks that, your whole announcement is completely ruined. So it's something you have to kind of weigh. I personally always, if, if something like that, being as a part of a, something as big as a Nintendo Direct, I always like to play it safe. And so anything, we put out all our press releases and everything after the fact. Um, but that's just me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hello. Hi. Uh, got a question regarding the NC stance on working with American uh, indie video games. Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah. Groups. In your regards as a translator, yeah. have you ever had to reverse engineer, so change English to Japanese and working on an American game that's meant for the global audience? Um, we personally at Inti Creates have never like taken an existing American game and then like localized it in the Japanese or, or, or something maybe like, like that. a new game um, coming out and they uh, someone says well I would like to work with Inti and want to produce it with you all we're here in America though how can you help us get it out to the world yeah I mean it's definitely you know, with the way just technology is nowadays it is certainly possible um, obviously you know, it can create a lot of logistical challenges, you know, even just from things as simple as time zones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if 
somebody's on the West Coast and you're in Japan, they're 16 hours behind you. So a lot of times when you're starting their day, they're ending theirs and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So things like that just off the bat can certainly make communication hard. Commu you know, you send out an email and they almost certainly probably won't see it until the next day. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that, it can really slow down communication. Um, but you know, if we were approached by like an American studio who wanted to say work with us or license us an IP, um, that is definitely something that we could do mm -hmm. and would be, you know, you know, if it's a legitimate inquiry, we're always, you know, willing to listen and hear those out. Uh, but, you know, it does definitely present a unique share of challenges, mainly not because of just the language thing, mainly just because, you know, it's hard to do face-to-face -face meetings, mm -hmm. it's hard to schedule things, you know, communication and all that kind of stuff. It can make, it can add a lot of time to the development cycle and just how long it takes to plan stuff just by simply, you know, having to wait so long for correspondence, unless everybody's staying up all night or getting up really early, depending on Absolutely. where you are, Absolutely. for sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Oh, thank you. Hello. Hello there. Hey. So I just have a question about maybe some of the games. I know some of them have had, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> they're lovely. So I had a question about some of the games. So some of them have had hard physical releases. Games yeah, yeah, like yeah. Gunvol and Dragmark were dead right. through Nighthawk, Bloodstain through Limited Run. Yep. There was Galgun was through P Cube. Yep, that's right. You and know your stuff. <laughs> yeah, and then there's rumors that Blast Master Zero got an ESRB rating through the publisher in the Callus. So is there any like process through it or any possible titles that are through going through the process of a physical release? Um, for us when it comes to physical releases, I mean I can't like, like confirm or deny anything that hasn't been announced at this point, but uh, when it comes to physical releases, um, for us as indie creates, we have the unique challenge because we are only based in Japan and we don't have like a US office or a European office, we cannot self-publish in North America or Europe or we can do it in Asia and Japan, but we can't do it in North America or Europe. So, you know, when we release a game in Japan, we can pretty much always do a physical if we want to because we can just do it ourselves and it makes things a lot easier. Yeah. Um, so when you when we want to release something in North America or or uh, Europe, you know, we have to, you know, it, it becomes a, a lot more work has to go into it. And because you need to find a partner who not only wants to produce a physical version of that game, that's, that's step one, is, you know, finding the partner who wants to go through all that. And, you know, you know, it's your best course of action, you know, like a limited run thing, so like we did with Curse of the Moon. It's your best course of action, a full retail release, you know, like we did with Gunvolt or Dragon Mark for Death. Um, you know, the needs of the project can vary from game to game. Um, but I know there are so many folks, and you got your limited run shirt yeah, I uh, represent. Yeah, I, totally, I, I totally respect that. Um, there's so much, as, I feel like as things have become more and more digital, the people who want physical media want it more and more and more. Mm. So we definitely know y'all are out there. <laughs> I mean, I'm that same person too. I love having physical media. If I can get something physical, I always do 10 times out of 10. The only time I will buy something digitally is if that is the only way to buy it or if it's like I'm getting this, a second copy of something. So, you know, if, if we had a U.S. studio, this would probably go a lot more. We'd probably see this a lot more often and, you know, we could – you know, do simultaneous releases with Japan, or we may be able to do like crazy collector's editions more often, things like that. Uh, you know, but you know, when we've worked with Nickel, I mean, not Nicholas, uh, with uh, Nighthawk Interactive, you know, they did a great job getting it's. It's honestly, there's something really special, you know, about going into GameStop or Target or Best Buy and seeing, oh, it's our little game on the shelf. You know, uh, you know, my my pinned tweet on my Twitter to this day is still for when I got. When I saw Azure Striker Gunvolt Striker Pack at the GameStop I worked at in high school, you know, there's something inherently really cool about that. Um, so for me personally, I am always an advocate for physical releases, and I think um, as long as it makes sense for us financially, and if we feel that there's enough demand for it, it is definitely something we will consider. And I think you know, Limited Run did a great job with Curse of the Moon. Um, Nighthawk's done a great job with Dragon Mark for Death and Gunvolt, so I think the future for physical releases is bright, but as pain, much as it pains me, I cannot make any promises, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. No, thank you. Hey. Um, Hi. 
I had a quick question. Sure. Because um, you guys are releasing on Steam with yeah. some games. How has that process been, like, um, working with Valve? and like? Honestly, um, Valve's been great. Um, we, uh, I started working with them back when we put uh, Azure Striker Gunvolt out back in, like, 2015. Mm -hmm. And I've had a couple guys over at Valve that I've worked with, you know, the same two guys I've worked with ever since. And they've honestly been an absolute delight uh, to work with. They've been really supportive of our projects. Um, you know, sometimes we've done, like, shadow drops on Steam, <laughs> which they always encourage us not to do because, you know, you want to get people wishlisting and stuff like that. Uh, but, no, they've been wonderful. We've had really great experiences working with Valve and putting stuff out on Steam so far. You know, and we got Blaster Master. <laughs> literally, when you guys, when I get back to my desk, I'm literally going to press, press the, the button, button press the button and <laughs> send it up there. And, you know, we are more and more realizing just how – powerful of a community steam is and every time we announce a game it's pc version win pc version win like yeah. <laughs> we hear it <laughs> we do um you know but it's just a matter of you know do we have the means to port it you know do we have the manpower to port it mm -hmm. um that's a lot of what it comes down to and you know but you know steam's done well for us and uh, i'm looking forward to getting you know like i said blaster master is the first yeah. it's not the last we got more coming up that we're going to be uh, releasing in the coming months, and honestly, I can't wait to share that information with you guys about that. All right, thanks, cool. No, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Hi. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm sorry for bringing up the game that would shot, so that sound like you named. Well, the mouth. Uh, what game? Mighty Number no. Nine. Okay, you can say uh, it. it's not. It's not Voldemort. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, was there any pressure uh, during the development and afterwards uh, of co-developing it with Comsap? Is, I'm sorry, say that one more time. Uh, was there any um, pressure put on you guys during and after the develop during and after the development of it? Like, what do you like mean by pressure? Like pressure to do something or to like fulfill the demands of the f not fans, but those who were supporting KG no Kune? Um, I mean, I was not personally involved with the Main Number Nine project. A lot of Stuff that Indie Creates did had kind of wrapped up by the time I had joined the company. Like, I joined, like, late 2014, and most of the stuff was already done by then. Um, yeah, but, you know, so I don't have much personal input to share when it comes to that. Um, you know, I know, obviously, a lot of people have many opinions about the game. Um, I think uh, I personally had fun with it, uh, just as a person who played the game, not taking anything else into consideration. I personally enjoyed it. Obviously, no game is for everybody. Um, but, you know, I can only control what I can control, and which for me in May number nine was unfortunately just about nothing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when it comes to, like, fan feedback and stuff like that, and, you know, if y y all creators and developers, they have a vision for the game. And I think, you know, obviously, you know, and this goes for any title, May number nine or anything else. You know, we obviously listen to what fans are saying. We obviously listen to how people feel about our titles. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we can take that into account when decisions are made. And I think any developer can say this. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the vision of the creators of, of what, how, what do they think will be the best game. Fans may, you know, the voices of the fans can sometimes influence that. And sometimes, say, oh, well, we never thought to do this. You know, if the fans really want this this much, hey, maybe we could do that. It really depends. Um, but, you know, we take that into consideration, but at the end of the day, it's uh, really up to, you know, people like the directors and the producers to how they want to take the direction of the game. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Hi. Hi. I had a general localization question. Sure, yeah, sure. I've always wondered. So let's say Inti Creates has this Japanese game. Mm -hmm. They want to rela release it in the U.S. and Mexico. Sure. Do they take that Japanese script and then have an English speaker translate it from Japanese to English, and then a Spanish speaker translate it from Japanese to Spanish? Or do you take the English one and then translate that to Spanish? It, it mostly depends on the language, but I think for, so for us, when we, we, when we translate anything into like e-figs, which is, you know, English, well, not English, more like figs, so French, Italian, German, Spanish, those are kind of like some of the big languages you get. Um, we always will do those, li like the Romance languages, a lot of European language will get translated from English. Um, some of our, I'm not involved with the like Chinese or Korean localizations that we've done, so I, I don't want to say something that's wrong. 
um, but sometimes it's easier for uh, like the East Asian languages to come from the Japanese. It really just depends on the localizer for those. Um, but for like any of like European languages or like Mexican Spanish or anything like that, those are always any game we've ever done. And I would say probably other companies is probably the same thing where those are coming from English. It's because you have a lot more people who are um, native English speakers or in Spanish speakers or vice versa than you have S Spanish and Japanese or French and Japanese. Just a lot more people speak French and English or Spanish and English. So um, it always comes from the English. So when you're localizing, you have to be mindful of that when you're making up, you know, say like character names or special terms that are created in a game. You got to think, okay, this is coming from English. How might this sound in French or Spanish or something like that? So that's something you got to take into account. I was thinking about that because I was imagining somebody in like France trying to figure out what the difference between Chicago and New York pizza was, <laughs> like in your example. <laughs> you know, and you know, honestly, to the localization team's credit, you know, sometimes they will, you know, if the whole, you know, New York Chicago pizza thing isn't jiving, maybe with a Portuguese speaking audience, just pulling out a random example, mm -hmm. maybe they, that person might find a more local example. But that's what makes localization great. As long as you can convey that idea to your audience, whatever language is in, you're doing it right. So I actually kind of wonder now if they did that <laughs> with that line. I'm really curious about that. But yeah, thanks. Great question. Thanks. Uh, hey, just a hey. general question. Sure. Um, what do you enjoy most about 2D action platformers or 2D action platformers and Gal Gun? Oh, my creators? goodness. What do I enjoy most about them? I mean, I grew up with 2D action games. Mega Man 2, which is still my favorite game to this day, was the reason I fell in love with video games at the tender age of like five. So, you know, those, those games like that have been a part of my life ever since I was absolutely able to hold a controller. Um, so, you know, I played Mega Man Zero when I was in high school, you know, playing my GBA, you know, during lunch or during study hall or during class sometimes, um, you know, playing games like Mega Man Zero. And I remember seeing like, who are these indie crates guys? I remember specifically the very first time I played Zero thinking that and, you know, life can take you in crazy directions. Um, but, you know, there's just something inherently, you know, especially with our a lot of the games that we make, they're a lot more fast-paced and very kind of intense. It's just pure fun. It's just pure, unfiltered fun for me. Those, uh, and I'm sure that, you know, my growing up with games like Mega Man and stuff like that probably influences that to this very day. Uh, but they just bring me so much happiness because they're just fun. I don't know if that's a crappy answer to your question. But no, 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 that's, that, that's fine. That, that's perfectly fine. I was just thinking. Yeah, no, that, they, 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 uh, th I can't think of any type of game that provides me with more enjoyment and entertainment than, you know, those 2D action games or action platformers and stuff like that. I have yet to find one. Maybe besides Final Fantasy Tactics, that's kind of like an outlier, but, you know. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hey, so you mentioned a little bit about uh, like having to handle other companies' IPs. Sure. Oh, yeah. We've done a lot over the years. Yeah, so I want to know what it's like uh, on the other foot, like whenever you guys handed out uh, Gunvolt to uh, <laughs> yeah. Blade Strangers. Yeah, yeah. Gunvolt's made the rounds. You know, he's uh, he was in Runbo by uh, 13M Games. He's in uh, Blade Strangers. Um, so when it, when it comes to licensing out our own IPs, you know, generally we have – so we have uh, uh, Yoshihisa Suda. He's the director of the Gunvolt series. So like usually, so when we grant the okay to use him in like Runbo or Blade Strangers or something like that, um, a lot of times what happens is like we give the okay, contract sign, great. You know they start creating the assets. You know like you know the art or what have you. So building all the assets in the game, and then you know they'll send us like, hey, here's how he's gonna look. Here's how he's gonna move. Here's what he's gonna do. And, you know, we'll put that off to the Gunvolt team, and they'll say, oh, well, you know, his jacket doesn't quite look like that. Tweak his jacket. Or, you know, well, when he uses his gun, it doesn't quite do that. You know, make you, you basically go back and forth of making tweaks and changes and fixes, basically until both parties are happy. And then, you know, once the Gunvolt team's happy, then they give their blessings, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the stuff's good to go. Uh, but, yeah, it's honestly been a lot of fun uh, working with other companies. Like, you know, the first one, like I said, was uh, Runbo, you know, 13 AA games, to their credit, they just reached out to us and said, hey, we love Gunvolt. Can we put them in our game? And we said, yeah, go for it. And they then they did. And it was a lot of fun. Cool. Uh, since I'm the only one up here, can I get another one? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All 
right. Uh, That's fine by me. Uh, uh, this was just something that just popped into my head, but um, you know, like whenever it was the Weston release, um, Gumble he got a shirt. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did. I wanted to know: uh, was that like a localization change, or was that like a call on the art team? So with the uh, with the Gunvolt, so f f so I don't know if you guys have ever seen Gunvolt, but he kind of has like so. Let me stand up for a second. He's like midriffs kind of exposed a little bit. So when Gunvolt One was originally brought to the U.S., they gave him like basically like a black undershirt, and the reason they did that, and the honest to goodness truth, is because they thought, and this was right before I joined, so I didn't get any input on this, but the reason why they did it was because they thought. Western audiences would think it looks cooler. Literally as simple as that. Um, whether you think it does or not, well, I guess that's up to you, the individual. But I guess the general consensus was the exposed midriff, because like for a lot of the Japanese fans, they think the exposed midriff looks cool. And I think generally if you've asked 50 American fans, of the, like, which one do you think looks cooler, the exposed midriff or not? Honestly, probably, they would probably say with the shirt. And honestly, I feel like he looked cooler with the shirt. Um, but at that point, we were just like, nobody really cares enough <laughs> to like make us stink about it. So we just kind of kept it from Gunvolt 2 going on. We just kind of kept it the same with the Japanese because there was no reason to change it. They just kind of thought it would look cooler. But yeah, it's really, it's sometimes it's literally just as simple as that. Cool. Thanks, man. Yeah, no problem. Um, if that is it for questions, then I will wrap things up. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Uh, I have not done a panel by myself in a really long time, so I appreciate you guys sticking around and hanging out with us. Um, we, Inti Crates, we are down in the Exhibitor Hall, booth number 22, uh, right by uh, Ultra Pro and Funimation and stuff like that. Uh, we got Dragon Mark for Death, Azure Striker Gunvolt, Gal Gun 2, and Blaster Master Zero 2, all available for, for demo downstairs. Got some merch for sale too, so feel free to come by uh, to the booth and uh, come say hi and hang out and play some games. So again, thank you all for coming here. Thank you all on Twitch, and uh, I'll see you guys again soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.